Health and Human Services Finance and Policy Committee to order. Today's date is Monday, April 4th, 2022. We've got two bills up here this afternoon and we're gonna start off with Senate file 4045 brought to us by Senator Coleman. Go ahead and uh, introduce your bill and we'll get this thing started. Wonderful, thank you, Welcome. Mr. Chair. Members, It's uh, I think this is my first in-person uh, time before this committee. I believe I was still on bed rest when I was here yeah. last year. <laughs> you know what, excuse me one second. I just jumped orders here, but uh, Senator Abler, would you like to move this bill? Uh, gladly, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Now that we've got our <laughs> proper things done, go ahead. Thank you. So this bill is pretty straightforward. As many of you remember in 2019, Senator Miller helped uh, the legislature create the Chloe Barnes Rare Diseases Advisory Council. It's currently housed at the University of Minnesota. And what this bill does is seek to move it to the Minnesota Council on Disability. This is the bill's second stop. And the reason for the move, and this was a move voted on by members of the council, is that when it was originally created, one of its main purposes was to advise the legislature on policies that will help the rare disease community, and they are unable to do so in their current home at the University of Minnesota. All of the stakeholders are in favor of this move, and I did hear from the university's lobbying team that they are not opposed to this move either. And so this bill simply moves, moves their home from one space to the other. And I do have uh, one testifier, I believe, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you, Senator Coleman. Yes, uh, so we've got uh, Miss Amy Gaviglioia, or help me out, I think I butchered it really bad. Welcome to our committee and uh, please identify yourself for the record. No problem, thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent. Well, thank you, Senator. Uh, key members of the committee, uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you today about Minnesota's Rare Disease Advisory Council. Uh, my name is Amy Gaviglio, and I'm the chair of the executive subcommittee for the council. Um, but before addressing the bill before you, I do want to take the opportunity to say thank you. Um, thank you for the foresight and commitment and understanding the importance of having a council directed towards addressing, <clears throat> excuse me, the numerous needs and gaps in care amongst the Minnesota rare disease community. Um, as many of you are probably already aware, rare diseases, while individually rare, are collectively common, uh, with as many as 580,000 individuals in the state of Minnesota having a rare disease. And bringing these individuals together under an umbrella of a rare disease community really allows us to examine the common challenges and barriers and advocate for needed policies and changes to really help ensure that all Minnesotans have the ability to reach their full potential. Um, in the past couple of years, our council members have successfully completed the nation's largest survey of rare disease patients, caregivers, and physicians. Um, the results of these surveys really highlighted that the needs of the rare disease community are vast and will only be met through robust advocacy and policy. Um, for example, nearly 60% of respondents indicated the value of telehealth and reducing burden of care. Almost 80% indicated delays or denials for novel and investigational therapies for their rare disease. And 44% reported problems with transition from pediatric to adult care. We know that Minnesota is fortunate to be home to many organizations conducting research into treatments of rare diseases, and we certainly look forward to continuing to leverage our relationships with these institutions while filling the identified gaps of access, education, and policy. Council members have really come to understand that the ability for autonomy in advocacy, policy making, and grant funding are absolutely paramount to truly making headway for the rare disease community. Unfortunately, as was mentioned under our current organization, we have been unable to find a path forward that allows the council to do these aspects of rare disease work to the extent needed. Um, certainly understandably, the University of Minnesota has their own policy initiatives and risk considerations, um, but this is hampering our ability to truly drive progress and represent rare diseases at a state level. As a result, the council assessed other potential organizations and we have determined that the Minnesota Council on Disability is in better alignment with the work that the rare disease community needs us to do. The Minnesota Council on Disability has expressed their support of this move and we both feel that the synergy of our missions will be exceedingly beneficial. Um, the bill before you provides language to this effect while also expanding on duties identified as needed from the surveys. Um, we do have Trevor Turner with the Minnesota Council on Disability here as well, um, should you have any questions for him. 
So again, on behalf of the council, we thank the legislature for their support of this work and community, and we are eager to enhance our efforts for the 580,000 individuals and their caregivers in the state. Thank you. Thank you. And next up, uh, we, oh. okay. 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 Um, next up, and why I had to stop is uh, I was going to call up Mr. Albrecht to uh, talk about the fiscal note, but also we do have um, um, a question that maybe we can get uh, a little input on before he uh, talks about the uh, fiscal note, and that is there was. Um, from what I understand, for, uh, the University of Minnesota had received $4 million for this. And if there's anybody with us that could help explain that, and then we will go from there to uh, uh, Mr. Albrecht to uh, speak to the fiscal note before us too. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Chair, I believe that would be my testifier if she wanted to address that. Uh, Chair, Okay, uh, Ms. Uh, Gaviglio. Yeah, Chair Aki, and members of the committee. I, I believe our appropriation is uh, was for four years and $150,000 for each of the four years for this council. Okay, so 150 for four, so you're talking uh, just 600,000 versus the uh, 4 million? That is my understanding, correct. Okay, uh, do you know anything about the 4 million? I, I unfortunately do not. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, is uh, I do also show available for questions. Uh, David uh, Davely, is he with us? Mr. Davely, could you uh, answer that question at all for us about the four million? Hi, for the record, this is David Dively, Executive Director of the Council on Disability. I am not aware of any appropriation for the Rare Disease Advisory Council or previously named uh, Chloe Barnes Advisory Council in that amount. I'm only familiar with the existing appropriation for two bienniums uh, per Ms. Caviglio's comment. Uh, it may be a separate similar appropriation, but I'm not familiar with it. Okay, thank you. Um, we will uh, then go to Mr. Albrecht, if you'd like to uh, just give us uh, an overview of the fiscal note that we do have in front of us. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so you have the fiscal note in front of you um, for Senate file 40405. Importantly on the front page, in the bolded uh, section there in the middle where it totals up everything that's going on in the fiscal note, the, the effect uh, in the general fund is zero uh, across all agencies. Um, and to get into the amounts um, for the individual agencies, we can go further in. And uh, starting on page five is um, the detail for the University of Minnesota and uh, the way the bill is structured, it relies on a, a statute for um, moving activities uh, um, around in state agencies and whatever money goes with those activities goes to the new agency and from the old agency. And so in this case, the University of Minnesota is saying that there remains $344,000 <clears> in fiscal year 2023 um, that they would transfer to the Council on Disability. And so similarly, um, on page eight is um, a transfer in of the same amount for the Council on Disability. And there's also a fiscal note for the governor's office <clears throat> which indicates a small amount of $3,000 in fiscal year 2023 that they say can be absorbed. And that is an amount for the governor's office to 
process the appointments for the 19 members uh, on the council. Thank you, Mr. Elbert. Um, members, questions, comments for Senator Coleman or our testifiers? Senator Wicklund? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wanted to make a comment that it seems like this is a really important council. And I remember um, when we created it, that it, it seemed like a, it would have a very, very valuable purpose for Minnesotans to bring focus to um, work on rare diseases. And so if this work to move it to a different home allows it to better fulfill the, the functions that we had intended, um, it seems like it would be a good, a good proposal. So thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Seeing none, final comments, Senator Coleman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members for the time. This is such an important issue for Minnesotans. You know, on a, on a personal note, my husband lost two siblings in infancy to a rare disease. And so anything we, that we can do to help this group further their efforts at the legislature will go a long way. So thank you very much for the time today. Thank you. And uh, Senator Abler, would you renew your motion that Senate file 4045 be recommended to pass and re referred to the Committee on State Government Finance and Policy and Elections. As you said, Mr. Chair, thank you. Thank you, Senator Abler. All members have heard the motion. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. Thank you, Senator thank Coleman. You. Welcome, Senator Dreheim. We've got Senate File 3249. If you would uh, like to move your bill be, be before us, and then you can introduce your bill. So moved. I'd, I'd like to move Senate File 3249. Okay. Um, Thank you. Should we adopt the uh, A11 amendment first? We can if you'd like. Okay. Okay. So. You, if you'd like to move the A11 then. I, I would like to move the A11, Chair. Okay. Members, we have the A11 amendment uh, before us. Uh, Senator Draheim, would you like to, we've got a number of amendments and uh, why don't we um, explain these as we go. So if you wanna give us an overview of what is in the A11. Sure. Um, members, uh, what we have before us here is a bunch of amendments to a um, kind of a, a mental health themed bill. And, and we've had a lot of great discussion around this topic this year. And um, I, I think we all agree that we need to do more in this area. And, and, and I think what you'll see in these amendments and, and in the bill language, um, in front of us is that we're, we're trying to get at more professionals for the mental health arena across the state, more transparency on those programs, what's working, what isn't working, um, more options. One size obviously does not fit all, especially in this area, um, more capacity, and of course, more funding. How do we pay for it moving forward? And I, I think that last piece is um, probably the most challenging. Um, the A11 amendment uh, has to do with um, locked facilities um, and adding to statute um, some requirements for locked facilities. And I'm gonna turn to uh, Senator Rosen and, and members, this is a team effort Senator Rosen has worked very hard on a lot of components in this bill. Um, we have components in here from Senator Isaacson and, and myself, Senator Senjum, Senator Nelson, Senator Abler, 
There's little bits and pieces that have all been brought together in here. Um, and, you know, it, it isn't one person's bill. Uh, it is a combined effort. So I'm going to turn it over to Senator Rosen, if that's okay. Let me get the mic on there. Uh, first up, we uh, was, we need to uh, a vote on the A11. We, uh, we've heard what's in the A11 plus more, but if we can go back to the A11, um, all those in favor of the A11, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Um, Senator Graham, do you want to take testimony now with the bill and the A11, or do you want to add the A12 to it before you do that? Chair, I, I was thinking maybe we should do the A12 also. Okay. Then uh, if you would uh, move the A12, we'll have a chance to. Members have got the A12 in your packets. Um, if you want to move it, Senator Draham, and then tell us what's in the A12. So um, the A12, I, I just received this A12. I was not in my packet, Chair. So I, I hope it's in. You know what? I think the A12 came, came, out. It came from Senator Rosen, right? Yeah. So Senator Rosen, could you uh, tell us what's in the A12? Uh, thank you, Senator Uckey, or Mr. Chair. I believe it's just um, something from, actually, I, I believe it is to clean up the, the fiscal uh, side of this. Perhaps we should get, um, <coughs> staff to go through that. I just received it to myself. Mr. Albrecht, sounds like they're dialing your phone. <laughs> um, Mr. Chair, Senator Rosen, um, most of the A12 amendment is uh, technical reflecting uh, the amounts on the spreadsheet that we will um, go through shortly. Um, I, the substantive changes are on lines 1.3 to 1.5, um, which um, uh, ask the, the counties in the, in, that are addressed in that section to prioritize evidence-based services when they're creating their plans. And then on lines 1.9 to 1.22, um, that sets up a requirement within the adult mental health initiative to um, have an ongoing process that um, identifies evidence-based policies and practices and then um, uh, conducts evaluations of them on, on an ongoing basis to, um, to look at um, promising practices or um, theory-based practices um, to determine whether or not there's indeed evidence to support those practices. And then Mr. Chair and Senator Rosen, the rest, um, like I said, is reflecting um, the amounts on the uh, spreadsheet, um, except for 2.8 to 2.12, which is the amount that goes with um, the evaluation language on uh, line 1.9. Thank you, Mr. Elbrick. Um, and then also, I believe, uh, I don't know if uh, Ms. Hoffman, let she won, because I you were involved in the drafting of this. Is there anything to add or did uh, everything get covered? It's good? It's good, Mr. Chair. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, members, we have uh, information on the A12 before us. All, we'll take a vote. All those in favor of the A12 amendment, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? <laughs> Motion passes, the amendment is adopted. Senator Drayheim, I think, uh, those are the two you need to uh, make your bill whole at this point. Correct. Ready for sure. testimony? That would be wonderful. Okay. Um, I have uh, first on the list, uh, Ms. Angela Youngerbird. Is she with us online? Yes, she is. Thank Welcome you. to our committee. Thank you. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Angela Youngerberg and I'm the Director of Business Operations for Blue Earth County Human Services. I'm testifying today on behalf of Blue Earth County, the South Central Community-Based Initiative, the Minnesota Association of County Social Service Administrators known as MAXA, and the Minnesota Inter-County Association known as MICA. Thank you very much for allowing me to testify today. 
This is an extremely important bill as it relates to both the current response to our state's mental health needs, as well as establishing a pathway for a vision that will create a stronger mental health system. Thank you for the language and the appropriation in this bill related to adult mental health initiatives specifically, as it's critical for addressing current concerns. A few concerns, DHS has signaled that a significant change in funding distribution will be occurring in the coming years that will essentially create winners and losers to the current funding levels. There will be over 30 counties that will see drastic reductions in the AMHI grants, which would result in an elimination of necessary services if that particular formula without additional funding goes forward. The proposed funding change was a reform or was a result of a reform effort, one that attempts to equal the playing field of mental health services and disregards the historical evolution of how an infrastructure has been built and thus needs to be maintained. The current level of state funding is only a portion of what funds these services. Currently, counties invest more than double what the state does in these specific community-based services. And still, across the state, there are significant issues with access to basic services. In some areas, there are services that are not available due, due to a lack of funding, and in others, the wait lists for services are up to six months or more for some specific services. An infusion of funds is desperately needed to address today's access crisis and a funding formula that the county's support is critical. Counties agree that reform to the system is needed, but to reform, one must understand the history and have a vision for the future. Simply moving money around to create winners and losers does not do this. So when thinking back in 2000, and, or excuse me, in 1995 to 2002, when the initial funding was established, DHS had a vision for the mental health systemic reform by developing these AMHI pilots, which ironically now are still pilots 25 years later. This bill does address that language and it's very much appreciated. The vision was to promote deinstitutionalizations of individuals from state hospitals. And in some areas, the state invested money and in other areas, they mobilized staff from state hospitals. It's true that not every region received an equal share, there just wasn't enough resource to go around. And so funding was focused on where people um, coming out of state hospitals would transition to. So the plan was to continually invest in the areas that didn't initially receive the same amount of funding in the beginning. And this hasn't occurred in the way it was meant to. The state investments in AMHI didn't continue to address the inequities. And so therefore there is an inequitable share of funding coming from county levy. So the reform formula must have a vision and counties really want to assure that no current services or systems of support are torn down as a result of modifying future formulas and allocations. We want to assure that our role as lead in systemic planning is upheld in the creation of future formulas. This bill indicates that through distributing funds, no adult mental health initiative will, re will receive less funding than right now. This is very much appreciated. And to give perspective on what the current formula would have done, the AMHI that I represent would have lost approximately 20 FTE in our mental health workforce. And we're not the only region that would be faced with this type of change. And so then the regions that stood to gain funding in the original DHS proposed formula without additional money, um, it's desperately needed. In those areas of the state, maintaining base workforce and mental health is nearly impossible. They have not built out their infrastructure to the point that they want to and have deserved to for many years. Counties see the current state as an opportunity to continue advance, to advance the vision of mental health infrastructure from so many years ago. Two of the most important resources to assure that this can happen are workforce and sustainable funding, and this bill directly addresses both. Moving forward, it also provides county policy leaders time to work with the department as technical assistance on creating a formula that addresses both the mental health systemic vision and that's focused on outcomes. In the immediate, it allows us to focus on the lagging issues across the state. So we know that AMHIs would need to invest um, in cur increase current services by at least 22% across the state and combined county investment to to meet today's demand for services. 
Additionally, this bill addresses the needs in um, officer involved care coordination, which is a first of its kind service that allows us to provide care coordination to individuals who have mental health and substance use disorder needs that have been in contact with law enforcement. We're seeing tremendous success with this work, reducing future law enforcement contacts and helping people engage um, their health concerns. This is a technical change and it will simplify the billing and administrative processes related to the service because currently the administrative pathway is um, extremely cumbersome for both counties and DHS, which restricts the access to this service. Thank you for your time and allowing for me to testify today on this really um, important bill that would substantially improve our mental health service system. Thank you and I will remain available for questions. Hey, thank you very much. Uh, next up, we've got uh, Colleen Devron. She's with us online. Welcome to our committee. Good afternoon. Uh, Chair and members of the committee, my name is Colleen Davern. I am a co-occurring therapist in both mental health and addiction, and I work with youth and shelters through Lutheran Social Services of Minnesota in Duluth. I will be testifying in support of ShelterLink mental health provision in this bill on behalf of Aspire Minnesota, Lutheran Social Services, and the other community-based mental health and homeless providers in our state. I wanna thank you for giving me the opportunity to share about this program and the profoundly positive impact that it has on the youth that we serve. One of the most impactful aspects of ShelterLink mental health is that it removes most, if not all external barriers to services. Through this grant, shelters provide rapid, if not immediate mental health services to youth that would not have access without it. In addition to removing external barriers, this grant uniquely allows for addressing the internal barriers to achieving mental wellness. Through embedding mental health into youth shelters, the culture of the shelter shifts from a safe place to sleep to being a place of learning, exploring, and growth. Through specialized training with staff on positive reinforcement, motivational interviewing and engagement strategies, mental health is now seen as an integral part of just being human. The stigma of being broken, bad or flawed is removed and it's replaced with a culture of empathy and connection because we all struggle some days. Often youth in the shelters have been sent to therapy as a punishment by schools, caregivers or other authorities and this can create a fear of therapy. This grant allows therapists to be proactive with the youth and provide therapeutic services in an organic and truly authentic way that resonates with them. This allows the youth to overcome their own fears and hesitation in addressing their mental health and wellness. This grant provides amazing opportunities to be proactive with high risk youth in addressing and preventing substance abuse. The youth are able to learn coping skills and build connections to increase overall well being and decrease the need or desire to engage in escape through substances in ways that other programs cannot. Staff at our location continue to learn to engage with youth to discuss goals, barriers, and strengths. They help the youth gain self esteem and learn how to use their strengths to achieve their goals. Many youth have been able to set goals they would not have thought possible prior to entering an environment of positive reinforcement and support. And this can include completing high school, reconnecting with family, and um, some of them are even now looking at going to college, which when they didn't think they would graduate high school, that's a pretty significant uh, goal for them to come up with. Um, staff are learning how to talk about emotional responses to stressors and conflicts with the youth. It gives them the opportunity to empower the youth to talk about their responses without judgment and choose healthy behaviors, leading to better relationships and more positive outcomes. With the help of this grant, youth can learn that mental wellness is a lifelong journey and they have a support system to aid them through it. Thank you, Chair and members, for your support of ShelterLink's mental health. As a team, we can continue to build resiliency and hope within the youth that we serve in our state. Thank you. Well, thank you. Um, next, we've got up uh, Ms. Sue, Sue Abderholden, also joined in this online here. Welcome to our committee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members. Sue Abderholden, Executive Director of NAMI Minnesota. 
Naomi, Minnesota greatly appreciates the commitment of Senators Dreheim and Rosen to continue to build our mental health system. With increased needs and workforce shortages, we need new investments to help children and adults in Minnesota address their mental health needs. I just want to briefly mention the specifics that we strongly support. One is establishing a grant program for mental health providers to fund supervision of interns and clinical trainees who are working towards becoming a mental health professional. NAMI had conducted a survey back in December of uh, mental health professionals and folks who want to be a mental health professional about what the barriers are to licensure. And a big one was that they couldn't afford to pay for supervision. We have about 5,000 people who completed their master's degree, but did not go on to become licensed. And so we think this will eliminate a barrier and help get people across the finish line. Um, next is allowing for locked earth facilities and with some startup funds so that we can provide care to people transferred from jail or have been deemed incompetent to stand trial and it's determined that they need to be in a secure facility. This recommendation came from the Competency Restoration Task Force. Um, not everyone needs the level of care that's provided at Anoka or St. Peter. Um, many of them need a lower level of care, but because there isn't a secure facility, they aren't referred there. Um, we appreciate the effort to require medical assistance managed care plans to pay at least the fee for service rate for mental health services. We often hear from providers that they're getting paid even less than that. We know that fee for service is already low, so paying less than that makes it really difficult. We appreciate the funding for schooling to mental health, which we know is a great program and really eliminates barriers for children to accessing care. As you've already heard, the shelter linked mental health grants are very, um, very, very good. Uh, more funding for the adult mobile crisis services so that we can have a mental health response instead of a police response. Um, adding some funds for the health prof professional loan forgiveness program for mental health professionals. Again, that has proven to be a very effective way. And then the, um, obviously you have funds in there for the mental health supervision grant program. I, I did want you to know that um, we've had several organizations and counties who have been working together to develop solutions to address, to address the critical needs of our children and youth. We see record numbers of children experiencing a crisis and they are ending up boarding in the ER. We believe the solution is to fund crisis stabilization services. Children are being assessed in the ER. The problem is that the level of care that they need isn't available or doesn't exist. There are waiting lists for hospital beds, residential treatment, psychiatric residential treatment facilities, day treatment, and even simply seeing a therapist or psychiatrist in the community. One level of care that doesn't exist is crisis stabilization. We do actually have a funding source to pay for this in our current residential or shelter system. And we believe this approach would be very helpful um, in making sure that children who don't need hospitalization but need that level of care can get it. Lastly, I wanna mention that counties, county attorneys, the Department of Human Services, public defenders and NAMI have all been meeting all session and last week nearly every day to continue to develop a consensus on how to address competency restoration. And I believe that we are very close to having a final agreement. We had uh, agreed last week that the forensic navigator should be their own board under the court system, much like the guardian ad litem board. Um, the uh, courts didn't want them, the counties didn't want them, DHS didn't want them, and we looked and we thought we could do something similar to the guardian ad litem board, which would have them be still within the court system, but having that independence that they also need. So again, I just really want to appreciate the work that went into this bill and thank committee members in advance for their support, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, next up for, to testify is Commissioner Terrell Clark. Welcome to our committee. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ms. Mr. Excuse me, Mr. Chair and members. It's good to be back. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to speak before you today. I'm Terrell Clark, Stern County Commissioner. I'm also the Health and Human Services Policy Committee Chair for the Association of Minnesota Counties. I'm testifying today on behalf of AMC and MICA. I'm also the AMC appointee to the Competency Restoration Task Force. Uh, first, I wanna thank all of you for your leadership and supporting the funding needs um, counties are very, as you heard Ms. Youngerberg say, counties are very supportive of a number of provisions in this bill, including locked ERTS, AMHI funding and reform and more. Um, however, I am here today to speak um, with a concern uh, with regard to the amendment uh, regarding competency restoration and forensic navigators. 
Um, again, I want to thank you all who have been working on this, and we look forward to continuing to work. We know that just trying to get through the rest of session can be a challenge in your creativity about how to move the broader mental health related uh, legislation forward is admirable. We agree that there is an immediate need to reform competency restoration and enact legislation that creates a path forward for Minnesota. And as a member of the task force, I can assure you that we took serious our charge, uh, the deep dive um, into this issue. We know there are still miles to go and we are committed to working towards the best possible policy resolution for this issue. We do believe there is a solution that will move us forward. Uh, that is one that Ms. Abderholden just referred to, the establishment of a competency restoration board similar to the structure of the Office of Guardian Ad Litem. As you know, competency restoration services have been long provided by the state. Currently, there's no infrastructure, statutory directive, or regulatory framework in place to provide these services uh, by other entities. There's a conflict between the duty of care of a county social worker and the responsibility of a forensic navigator. Counties are committed to continuing to be a great partner in facilitating and coordinating mental health treatment and services, but we feel it's inappropriate for human services to be in the judicial system reporting the failures of our clients who elect voluntary services. So I must say, I take, do take a bit of issue with what my friend Ms. After Holden said. We didn't say no lightly, and I know she didn't mean to imply that, but it's for that reason and that there are 87 different counties, as you know. We believe that the, uh, the correct place for this new program lies at the statewide level rather than in 87 different counties. It's appropriate the responsibility lie with the court or the state of Minnesota to ensure consistent programming and capacity throughout the state. The task force recommended that there be developed a standardized, flexible, statewide competency restoration curriculum. HHS services are tailored to each community, but the judicial system is committed to the same process and services being available in each part of the state. Court procedures do not deviate from county to county. We believe it's imperative that competency restoration be provided at the state level by an agency that specializes in the niche field of competency restoration. Through negotiations, as you heard, with other stakeholders, we have come up with an agreement on this and believe this will be our path, pathway forward for the people impacted, for communities and for the state and look forward to working with you, uh, hopefully to make that happen. I'd also like to note that we're greatly appreciative of Senators Rosen and Abler's work to include appropriations for forensic navigators um, in this bill and Senator Jerry Hans as well. We equally appreciate comments that your intent is not to increase new unfunded mandates for counties. Recognition that this is not a service that could be absorbed by counties without sufficient funding is really important to ensuring that this program is successful all across the state. When direct care and treatment was given millions of dollars to do this work a few years back, they couldn't keep up with the demand. That should be an indicator of how big a deal this really is cost-wise. We're concerned about the ability for $2 million to cover any entity for this new service. I wanna make sure we get a good grasp on what it will actually cost. So in close, thank you again for your work. This is such an important bill and we look forward to being partners as we come up with the best policy solutions by the end of this session. Thank you. Thank you. And that reaches the end of the list of testifiers that I have. We have Ms. Kirsten Anderson who we see on, on Zoom here, but uh, she's here to answer questions when we get to that section. Anybody else that uh, wants, wants to testify before we go to our amendments? See nobody rushing up here. Um, let's go back to some amendments we need to get through and then we will uh, get to member questions and comments. And uh, uh, Senator Dreheim, I'm gonna uh, pull rank and start off with the first amendment. Best Sounds amendment good, of the day, right? <laughs> but anyhow, thank you. I'd like to move the A5 amendment. And uh, let me tell you a little bit about that. Um, this amendment is using music for better, better mental health outcomes in our children. Uh, music has positive cog cognitive and emotional impacts on us. Music is joyous and playing music increases that feeling. It takes us out of the moment and allows us to reframe our perspectives. Unlike school, 
online school partnerships offers individualized direct instruction. We have witnessed what has happened to our kids over the past two years. Mental health issues have increased greatly. With this program, students in one-to-one -one settings or small group sessions receive prioritized attention of a safe and caring adult who has specific knowledge and information for their area of study. 91% of the students agree and or strongly agree that they like their teaching artist, which speaks to the relationship building occurring through this virtual instruction. These McPhail programs have fostered consistency and stability despite the ongoing challenges of the pandemic by increasing consistency and stability for students. 52% of the students agreed or strongly agreed that online school partnerships made them more excited to come to school and 83% reported that they liked attending online sessions. After two years of isolation, getting kids back to school with their friends and teachers is so important. This music offering is one more thing to help restore our kids' mental health. McPhail's online programs are able to reach across all of Minnesota. Improved individual performance and success within a larger community, such as musical ensemble, leads to an increased connection and a feeling of belonging with the community of peers. Students listed their confidence and ability to focus as good or better after working with online school partnerships. And finally, the appropriation. It's at $300,000 for fiscal year 2023 would be appropriated, but this would expand online music education for Minnesota schools and would be available until the end of fiscal year 2025. Schools and private foundations contribute as well. Senator Dreheim, that is what I have brought before you, any comments or concerns? No, uh, Chair, uh, it's just, we'll have to figure out where to take the money from okay. on, on that. Um, I love music. Okay, members, uh, any comments or questions on the amendment? If not, oh, Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just want to thank you for bringing this amendment. Uh, the um, online music, uh, has been a gift to students all across this state uh, to have that access and particularly at a time where they have been isolated and we know that uh, mental health needs are escalating I just uh, wholeheartedly support and can't wait to vote for your amendment. Thank you. Seeing no further comments or questions with that members all those in favor of the A A5 amendment please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? The amendment is adopted. Okay, thank you. Next up, we have uh, Senator Dreheim showing A9. He wanted to- uh, Sure, I, I would like to move the A9. Move the A9, and then would you like to tell us about it? Sure. Uh, members, we, we've had uh, various hearings uh, on this topic, and it, it is for the mental health um, hospital bed moratorium. Um, I, I have tried to include um, a, a lot of stakeholders on this discussion. Uh, I want to thank Senator Klein for his two cents uh, on this uh, amendment, if, if you will. And, and that's not saying he supports every aspect of it, but I, I, we need all hands on deck on this uh, bill. And, um, you know, I, I mentioned this the other day, you know, it's my sixth year here in the Senate and we keep on saying no and no and no to ideas to help people. And this is a step in the right direction. I think we can do this, you know, this is my thoughts with input from members here um, how we can do it, review it, take a step back and decide if we want to continue having hospital beds, um, a free for all, if you will, or if they have to come and go through a process, you know, what is the impact on society? All I know right now is we, ha we have a shortage and we have a shortage of mental health beds across the state for all types of Minnesota residents. So 
Um, I, I think this will help get more creative on different types of services across the state. And hopefully we'll have um, some big players and some small players step up and get creative in their communities and help try to solve the problem. So. Yep. Thank you. Members, questions, comments on the amendment. Senator Klein, and it sounds like you need to uh, increase your fees a little bit because two cents is awful cheap. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Senator Dreheim, uh, for the amendment. And I appreciate that the, since we saw this last, some good provisions have been added. I appreciate you reaching out to everybody involved. And looks like we got a sunset on there, which I think is important. We got a report at the end saying how many beds were added. Um, those are good provisions. Uh, I guess I, I'm going to vote for it today. I think so, like you're trying to do, we need to light a fire under this issue and get more beds in the state of Minnesota. The only thing I'd suggest maybe as it keeps going forward is um, that we get something back in terms of uh, how many beds are being added before January of 2027. That we know, you know, next year there were this many, the following year there were this many. So we know if this is actually being accessed or being effective as we go along. So thanks very much. Thank you. Uh, Senator Draham, did you? I, I just oh. want to thank thank Senator Klein for the input, and uh, we can work on some language for the for the next stop on on this. So. Thank you, Senator Wicklund. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Chair. I um, I'm glad to have the discussion again about this topic. Um, I I think I I still have um, as we discussed in the last time this was brought forward, I still have a lot of concerns about just opening this up. Um, I think the public interest review process does serve a, a purpose that we should be trying to understand um, what the most important parts of that process are for us as legislators uh, to be able to do our job better in terms of assessing projects. And I think the way that this bill um, just kind of opens up the um, process without any structure around it, um, granting a, an exception for a type of um, bed. Um, I don't think that gives us enough feedback um, or information before some of these big decisions might get made about, you know, building a, a new hospital that's a psychiatric hospital. And I think, for example, um, just one example in terms of what uh, impacts I'm, I'm talking about is that we we could see impacts on other providers in communities, um, whether they're ones that we've already talked about. I mean, we've talked about the proposal that Fairview has brought forward um, and some of the concerns about the impacts of that proposal on other um, health providers in the area. And um, if this is implemented and there were other projects in other parts of the state, I mean, there could be impacts to other providers that we don't know about. And, and so I guess my concern is that we, if we do this, we kind of let that, um, let our ability go to understanding more about those impacts before, before the decisions and the big commitments are made. So I, I'm certainly open to talking more about, I mean, how, how do we do that better so that, you know, the, pro the process is um, done in a timely way, may, way that matches, you know, business needs. But um, I'm not, I, I just have a real concern about um, putting in place this language right now without having um, a chance to further discuss how do we assess greater impacts, you know, and, and that wouldn't necessarily be from a business standpoint of the person, of the entity implementing the project, but it could be impact on another um, another type of facility that's in place. So, thanks. Um, members, more comments, questions? Seeing none, let's, uh, I guess we need to vote on the A9. All those in favor of the A9 amendment, please signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, opposed? The amendment is adopted. Okay, um, next up I have on my list, uh, Senator Wicklin with the A7. Sure, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this one I brought forward um, as we talk about mental health um, and um, substance abuse and the ability to get access to treatment 
Um, I think another consideration is um, on the side of you know mental health parity and the requirements in law to uh, for people to be able to access um, treatment through their different health plans. And this amendment would simply would set up um, a way to have a, an accountability office in the state um, that would be able to oversee reviews that have to do with compliance with mental health parity laws um, that would be able to conduct um, stakeholder engagement processes so people understand what their um, requirements are for them to fulfill the, the federal and state laws and then to review um, consumer and provider complaints um, and be able to um, be a resource, not only for uh, consumers, but also for health plans to be able to make sure they understand uh, what the requirements are and how they go about fulfilling them. Um, I was looking at um, different um, actions that states have taken across the country and um, having a way to uh, coordinate and communicate between the health plans and um, the departments that are involved like Commerce and the Department of Health is really um, important in ensuring that people have um, access to the, their coverage um, that's required through mental health parity laws. Um, so I think putting this office in place would, would help us in Minnesota. We, we do have people who struggle to uh, access the care that they need. Um, it can be because of um, the way the health plans are, are written perhaps, or you know, consumers understanding what they're able to access. Um, and this would be a way to make sure that, that there is a process for finding out um, you know, where any issues are um, either before their plans are, are put in place or if it's after that, um, it could be for com consumers to be able to get uh, feedback on you know, whether their plan is complying with mental health parity laws. And then there's an appropriation for, uh, to fund that office. Thank you, Senator Drayheim. Comment on, on the amendment? Um, you know, my, my first question is the, the half a million dollars is just to set up the program and then the ongoing costs would be that moving forward, Chair, or Senator Wickman? Yeah, that I, I would need to do a little more research on that. And I put this together. We had uh, limited time over the weekend to, to work on it, but I, I would look into whether it needs ongoing funding or if, you know, with this setup, then if they could do the work on an ongoing basis. Senator Draham. Chair, sure, thank you. Uh, Senator Wicklund, and then if I operated a clinic, where would I go to report a problem? What What's the the uh, pathway, I guess, would I go to the Department of Commerce or Department of Health? Who would I? That's actually- Senator Wicklund. Oh, sorry, um, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, that's part of the um, role, I think, is to help um, entities know better, you know, what the process should be because there is, um, there are multiple agencies that are involved and the federal government. Um, and this office would, I think, help to coordinate um, whether they need to be talking to the Department of Commerce or Department of Health, or if it's a Department of Labor federal issue. Senator Draham. You know, I, I, I think this is an interesting concept that we need to unpack a little further. I think for now, I, I would just oppose the amendment and uh, we can look at it uh, maybe next year and, and dig into it a little bit more. It probably require the bill to go to commerce after this, if we accepted this, Chair. Thank you, Senator Draham. And I will just be, get a couple other questions and I'll also comment just briefly. The mental health parity issue, I know that uh, looking here at the screen, uh, a couple of years ago, Ms. Abderholden and I worked on a bill that did get passed and everything just dealing with this exact same thing. So we have had um, and there was stuff prior to that. We, we have had multiple rounds of uh, the mental health parity issue and they have passed. So we've got, we do have things in place. With that, um, Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I was looking and drafted to 62Q. Uh, Senator Wicklund, would they have any purview over PMAP? Senator Wicklund. 
Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I guess I don't have a quick, I don't have a quick answer to that. I'd have to find out. Senator Benson. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. And we do have an ombudsman for mental health and developmental disabilities. And I'm wondering if we wouldn't be better directing resources to someone who's a concentrated point for a mental health ombudsman. So that mental health ombudsman was recently established and would be an opportunity for people who are having issues with mental health parity to then be directed from an ombudsman rather than the regulator at the Department of Commerce. And so I think there is opportunity there using um, a mental health ombudsman so that the consumer could be directed to the proper regulatory place. That would be my recommendation. Senator Wickland, excuse me, Senator Wickland, any comment to that? Or? Uh, I, I, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think that that would be a good idea. Um, and I can definitely look into that. I think part of the um, kind of the mechanics of this have to do with interactions with the health plans in detail with setting setting up their plans and working with the Department of Commerce. But I think certainly the, the ombudsman, that would be a good way if we could find out more about um, how consumers are um, experiencing the, the parity requirements. And, and I'll definitely, yeah, I can look into that as well as whether we have any coverage of the, the PMAP aspect. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, next up, Senator Klein. No, no, okay. Any further comments, questions? Otherwise, we'll, Senator Wicklin. Um, yeah, Mr. Chair, I mean, I've, I've received, I guess, good helpful feedback and I'll, I'll withdraw this amendment for right now and we'll, I'll have some more discussion with people about how, if we can structure it better or if we should uh, wait and bring it forward at another time. Okay, so, thank you. The, the A7 is withdrawn and uh, next, show Senator Wicklin, you also have an A-10. If you'd like to uh, describe that to us. Yeah, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, the A-10 amendment has to do with adult day treatment services. Um, this is um, adult day treatment is an intensive mental health service that provides skills training to support a person to live and function more independently in the community. Um, there are at least seven uh, providers, hospitals and community providers of this service. And um, currently the funding um, sources for it are um, the, the, the rates that they receive, uh, reimbursement rates they receive are inadequate and, and several of them are really on the verge of, of having to close. But I think that they really provide a valuable service in the community. Um, it includes uh, multidisciplinary treatments, it prevents hospitalization, and it supports um, discharge from the hospital. Um, and um, due to the historically low reimbursement rates um, and lack of having uh, mental health parity for all people on all different types of insurance plans, um, these programs, as I said, are, are at risk of closure. Um, so this amendment would appropriate um, 261,000 in fiscal year 2023 uh, to cover these programs. And then there's a, it would be a, a change in the rate and then the general fund base would be 658,000 in fiscal year 24 and 692,000 in fiscal year 25. Um, part of the issue with this is that there are, um, there's another type of service called um, intensive outpatient uh, model, and that is not covered by Medicaid, um, and commercial payers have moved more towards covering that service um, and not covering adult day treatment. Adult day treatment is covered by Medicaid, and so if those programs are um, have to close, uh, the people on Medicaid will not have access to um, the service if they're if Medicaid doesn't cover the um, the other service, the intensive outpatient model, and so that's kind of an issue of um, disparity between those who have public assistance and those who have uh, commercial insurance. 
So I, I really like to see us um, discuss and be able to fund this. Um, it's not a, a huge amount, but I think it would really make a, huge, a big difference to those who are um, who need these access to these treatments. Okay, thank you, Senator Drayheim. I've got Senator Abler that's been waving his hand on it. Would you like Senator Abler to go first or would you like to weigh in first? I, I appreciate the amendment, but I, I think it does probably belong in Senator Abler's committee. Okay, thank you. We'll go to Senator Abler. Mr. Chair, we haven't even talked. It's like telepathy. I don't know. It's where we do office nearby, Mr. Chair, and six years of working together. Uh, I actually think this amendment has merit. Uh, particularly in terms of rates and closures, which is a topic of a bill we're taking up tomorrow, which has a slightly higher target. And I'm afraid that if we did this here, it would just ruin some of the good work uh, slightly higher. Um, anyway, that it would be hard on this bill, but I think there's a way to work on this. I'm not sure if 50% is the right number, but um, if you, if Senator Wickman, if you want to work on that for tomorrow, see if we can pull something together that to actually to move forward. Senator Wickland. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I'm definitely happy to work with you on that. Yeah, thank you. Okay. And so I'll I'll withdraw Correct. the amendment from this committee now. Okay. Thank, thank you. you. The A10 amendment has been withdrawn. Um, next one I show is uh, Senator Klein. You've got the A13. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Drayheim and Senator Rose and I offer the A13 amendment, which should be before the members, and I can explain it when ready. Okay. Please go ahead. Uh, Mr. Chair, I, I think we all know that uh, healthcare professionals have been under strain in these last couple of years as never before. Uh, hospital utilization and censuses are higher than they've been in a generation. Medical uh, utilization is high in every delivery system. Uh, healthcare workers are providing care to patients who are often in sealed rooms uh, and disallowed from having visitors. Uh, and they're doing this while wearing full biohazard gear. Uh, a significant change in sort of the culture of nurturing and contact uh, that was the reason we all went into healthcare in the first place. Um, and uh, this is done in a setting where we know we have workforce shortages. Uh, and in, at the same time, there's been a sharp uptick in sort of violence and hostility directed against healthcare workers. Um, all of this together, combined with the fact that there's a cultural resistance within the healthcare community to understanding their own mental health needs uh, and their own potential for burnout uh, has led to uh, a tremendous increase in dropout rates and retirements among healthcare professionals, nurses, and physicians, increase in suicides among physicians. Uh, and we need to address that. We need to treat our healthcare workers correctly. What the age 13 does, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, is seeks uh, to develop and implement uh, an education and awareness initiative that raises the profile of uh, burnout uh, and mental health strain that healthcare um, workers may experience and encourage them to seek appropriate resources. Uh, and it uh, appropriates a million dollars from the general fund to the Commissioner of Health to uh, implement this program. I appreciate your thoughtful consideration, Chair. Yeah. Thank you. Senator Drayheim, comment on the A13. Thank you, Chair, and, and thank you, Senator Klein, for bringing this forward. A um, couple thoughts that popped in right away. Um, you know what? Thank you for bringing up the topic too, and I appreciate everybody that works in the healthcare industry uh, and the work they've done the last couple of years. So, what what do can you just briefly describe what options are available for employees that are in that environment right now? What what do most clinics or hospitals offer to their employees? Senator Klein. Mr. Chair, from my own experience, I, I can't tell you the answer because I don't know, it, um, which I guess is an answer in itself. Um, I'm not aware of what resources are available to me or to a nurse who might be experiencing strain or crisis uh, at, the, at a facility. So uh, there probably are such programs through HR, but uh, they are not uh, high profile. Senator Graham. Are there, uh, Senator Clyde and Cherokee, thank you. Um, are, are there other programs that you are aware of that they could take advantage of? that are, are non-hospital or clinic based? Senator Klein, oh, Senator Klein. Uh, Mr. Chair, once again, I must plead ignorance to the answer to the question. I, I do not know. Okay. Senator Dre, I'm... One last question, Chair. Um, you know, it says develop and implement um, in, in the million dollar um, is a one-time appropriation. What about the ongoing expense then? 
Senator Klein. Well, Mr. Chair, I think, uh, you know, true to our uh, commitment to sunsets within this uh, institution, we should do the one-time appropriation, uh, then come back as a legislature and review thereafter and see if it had an impact or was meaningful or something we'd want to fund on going. Okay. Got a couple uh, additional questions. Senator Abler. Thanks. Well, Senator Klein, I think you're onto something, um, but I think we're forgetting something. I mean, so I, there's, I don't know if it's going to go on today. I just have a sense about that, but trying to rescue the idea. Um, two entities we need to think of. One is the Department of Health, which has been rained on money uh, in the last couple of years for the very purpose of COVID-related burnout, et cetera. I don't know why, I don't know why they're not doing this in the first place as one of their duties, as a duty, like what you do, Department of Health, you know, mental health for professionals who've been keeping the world open that they've so happily commended you all for, and they should, I, I, <laughs> I just think they should do this. But also in terms of disseminating this information, every one of those individuals has a licensing board and they communicate with their licensees and through email and other ways as, different things that come out of the mail. Um, you know, I'm, if you want to play with this, I, I, I'd be happy to, I mean, I don't know. It's, I mean, I don't, I, I would be nervous to take the million dollars out of any of this stuff. So what do you want to not do that that would do? But in the case of like these, we have, it's $73 billion has washed its way through Minnesota uh, uh, in COVID relief money. Uh, and some of that has been almost functionless. And all the things you want to do is rescue these good folks who continue to be the backbone of our work. So I'm just offering that to you. And so that's all I got. Thanks. Thank you. Senator Klein, any comment? I appreciate the offer from the chair of the Human Services Committee, and I'd like to continue to work with you on that, depending on how this amendment is treated today in committee. Okay, thank you. Mr. Senator chair. Senator Benson. Oh, who was, oh, oh Senator Rosen. Oh, I'm sorry. You want to, you want to comment first or would you like? I was just going to say uh, between the exchange, Mr. Chair, I think it'd be great to just get um, the Department of Health in a room and start talking about how this would look and who should be um, in that group. And we could facilitate that and get that ball rolling and not just uh, rely on them to do it on their own, but we can certainly push them to do this. Thank you. Senator Benson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Senator Klein. Um, Senator Murphy and I had worked on something that had to do with peer-to-peer -peer support. And so there is language. Um, I'm trying to find it as fast as I can. Um, yes, there is coverage for, in most, most healthcare systems for counseling, but post-crisis, how do we help retain medical staff that has undergone unprecedented stress? And so I think um, there might be a path forward I would prefer to look at something that mirrors the peer-to-peer -peer, um, that was done for um, substance abuse and diversion and, and those kinds of things so that it we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Uh, but our healthcare, uh, just retaining them and acknowledging the reality of what they went through is important. I know where your amendment's going. I'm going to see if I can find the language and, and get it to you and see what you think. Okay. Senator Graham, final comments on what you'd like to do with the A13? You know, I, I appreciate the concept. I think it is something that needs to get flushed out a little bit more and maybe uh, between uh, Senator Benson and Senator Abler and Senator Klein can work together on it. But at, at this time, I'm, I'm going to Say that I think we should hold off on accepting this. Okay, Senator Klein. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you to all the committee members. Um, I sense an authentic devotion to this pretty important issue, and I think we have to do right by our healthcare workers in this state. It's it's been pretty tough on a lot of people, and uh, this is the committee where we can try to make that right and heal that. So um, I'm going to withdraw the amendment, uh, and I but I think let's try to do something this session about this, Senator Graham. Thank you. The A13 is withdrawn. Senator Nelson. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I have the A14 amendment, although I just want to be clear that uh, it is only digital at this moment. So the, the paper copies are not here, but uh, Mr. Chair, I would like to just briefly um, move the amendment and speak to it, if I might. Okay. Until those copies come. Go ahead, Senator Benson, the A14. Yes, okay. thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, members, uh, the A14 
is the um, Alzheimer's, uh, actually it's Senate file uh, 147 uh, that would be, that I'd be seeking to amend on. And what this is, is it's the Alzheimer's Public Information Program. Uh, many of you remember several years ago, we passed the Alzheimer's Research and Support Act. Uh, there was one small piece that did not pass because, well, we, we just didn't have the funding. And that's what you would see here in the A14. Uh, this is the public awareness campaign that does two things uh, that are so critical. Number one, it would, um, it would uh, make publicly available the amendments coming, Mr. Chair. Um, it would promote uh, early detection, which is key for so many things, but particularly Alzheimer's. And it, was, it would be a statewide public information program uh, that would again focus on the importance of early detection uh, with the meeting with the uh, healthcare provider in discussing uh, cognition. And we know the early warning signs, we know how important early detection is um, and how important this would be. We know that Alzheimer's, we have a tsunami of uh, as, as more and more uh, of our population is in. Uh, uh, at more advanced ages, we see Alzheimer's increasing uh, dramatically. Um, and again, uh, the commissioner then would um, include those program materials, those uh, messages directed to the general population, as it says in line 1.13, uh, and also to reach underserved communities, including but not limited to rural populations, native and indigenous communities, and communities of color. And uh, the program materials would, as most do, include culturally specific messages for those particular uh, communities as well. And um, again, members, it's, it's, uh, I have to confess I'm a little late coming to the table with this amendment. Uh, I, I didn't realize that it uh, was not uh, included in the omnibus bill. But uh, Mr. Chair, uh, and I also want members to know that the request is for that one-time appropriation of $250,000 to fund this important work uh, for Alzheimer's early detection. Uh, and we know that it will in be inc incredibly valuable, not just to the people involved, but to, but to our public health as well. Um, but Mr. Chair, because I'm a, a little bit late here getting this to you, and I'm not even sure if the public has had a chance to see this yet, I will just take this opportunity to, to um, move the amendment uh, to get it on the, on the record uh, as important, but I will withdraw the amendment so that uh, perhaps this might be considered in finance rather than um, asking at this uh, late date for it to, to move forward here. So with okay. Mr. Chair, that, those were my comments in, in hopes as this moves forward into finance, we can add this small piece that will uh, certainly be uh, significantly valuable to Minnesotans. So I withdraw my motion, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Nelson. And I was just about to ask if there was other amendments and you beat me to that. So I will ask, I'll finally get this out. Are there any other amendments to come before us? If, if not, let's, oh, Senator Graham. You know, if, if it's possible, Chair, I, I'd like to, Senator Rosen to kind of just go through what we have right now and uh, before we run out of time. Yep, no, that'd be appropriate. We'll go through Senator Rosen's information and then we'll take and get to any questions or comments up here at the table from members. But so go ahead, Senator Rosen. Thank you, um, Mr. Chair. Either myself or Mr. Albrecht could run through this, but as uh, Senator Draheim said, I think everybody has got a footprint or a, a piece in this bill. And we've had many meetings to get it to the place where it's at, a, a tremendous commitment going forward. Section one, Senator, Mr. Chair, is yours, establishing the provider uh, supervision grant program, which um, Ms. After Holden talked about eliminating the barriers. That's $2 million for FY23 and $2 million for 24 and, and 25. And they will be to license or certified mental health providers to fund the supervision of interns and clinical trainees working to become mental health professionals. Um, and we would also subsidize costs of licensing applications and licensing fees. I think that's a really important, as she said. Section two, 
is requires DHS before making changes to existing DHS grants to report on the effect of any changes and other relevant information. The report will be submitted to the committee chairs and this would increase the oversight and reporting on grant programs if DHS tries to modify the grants. And this was put in here because of the AMHI's, the Adult Mental Health Initiative and the situation um, that came forward with our counties that uh, created winners and losers. Section three is deals with that. That is actually Senator Francis' um, bill, and I believe Senator Draham and myself are on that to Blue Earth County. Ms. Young, Ms. Youngerberger brought that to our attention, and it's it's a it's a, a very strong commitment to make sure that the counties that were being penalized are left harmless, and the ones that do are that are going to have a rate adjustment will continue to get that rate adjustment. Sections four and five is Senjums, Senator Senjums, which, which allows certain residential settings to operate locked facilities to provide treatment for patients who have been transferred from jail or incompetent to stand trial. <clears throat> and that's 1.5 million for FY23. And then um, section 26 is the Community Mental Health Supervision Services County-based pur purchasing grants. That's a small amount of money for 23, 24, 25. And seven, uh, section seven is the officer involved community-based care coordination modification. It deals with, uh, you uh, members around the table know of the yellow line project. Section eight and 10 establishes the forensic navigator service definition, for competency restoration. That's a big commitment also, um, $6 million for uh, FY 22, 23 and 12 million for 24, 25. Section 11 directs DHS to recommend ways to implement a MA eligible health benefit for children in mental health crisis. That's 500,000 for FY 23. Section 12 is Senator Dreheim's a mental health urgent care facility pilot program. And I believe uh, Senator Isaacson worked with you on that too. That's $4.5 million for FY 23 that establishes grants for medical providers and nonprofits to quickly provide mental health care for young people for up to 72 hours. The grants would be used to create mental health urgency rooms for people under 25 who are experiencing mental health crisis. And then of course, section 13 is the school link mental health grants. We're all familiar with that. That's 2.4 million for FY 23 and 24 and 25. And then the shelter link uh, mental health grant, that's where a lot of this all started, is uh, section 14. That's 2 million for FY 23, 24, and 25. That's going to allow more than just the five sites that are currently statewide. There's 55 sites eligible, and uh, three are in the metro, two are, are in the greater Minnesota. That is, uh, we'd like to expand that because they do have the evidence based results on how appropriate and how um, important that program has been. And then the section 15 and the expansion of the mobile crisis services, 4 million for FY24 and 8 million for FY25. And then we do have the professional loan forgiveness in section 17, 2.75 million for FY23, 24 and 25. And that is it. And if I missed anything, uh, please, uh, Mr. Albrecht mention it, but it over Three years, 75.574 million. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Oh, plus the 300,000 for the music program. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure that out. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Senator Abler. Well, thanks. And actually, this is by council as bill review. Um, so on the competency part, uh, and I appreciate everything that I've heard from four or five individuals about this, including Ms. Abderholden and and uh, Ms. Clark. Um, so not to belabor this very long, Anoka County has an average of 80 felons a year who are deemed incompetent. And if they haven't gone to AMRTC, no one really tracks them. And every so often they decide to shoot somebody in a bus or stories like that that are tragic. And so I appreciate the enthusiasm and the critical timing of moving something forward now that we've become aware of this. And it's kind of been a hidden thing, but it's, it's there. Uh, and as, in terms of their concern about the language in the bill, uh, it's a bunch of words on paper, but there's $6 million a year tied to it. So this is actually the first committee 
in the legislature that has moved forward some kind of language with some kind of money in an effort to address it. It does need discussion, needs more buy-in. Um, but I don't know what the two judiciary committees are gonna be doing here. I'm not privy to their, their secrets, but I think it's really critical uh, to us in this niche, the health and human services chunks that have seen this bill, that we identify uh, the mental health need, but also put an edge toward the public safety need. And so, um, you know, we're gonna be talking to everybody and at the end, the goal is not to jam some amendment down somebody's throat, but to get something to actually begin to address this. But I wanna tell you for my money, and I'm not the last decision maker, I'm, maybe I won't even be in the last discussions, uh, we trust the counties. They have a probation department, they do corrections, they're, they already deal with those who came out of AMRTC, that's their job. They have to have quarterly meetings with them. Anoka County does weekly or monthly, I found out if they're more severe at risk. Uh, but it's a grievous uh, concern for anybody who's paying attention to this. So, so good news to those who express concerns. Here's a bill, here's $18 million over three years going this way. Uh, which provides the basis for something to go. It's actually a bill that's really moving. Um, so it's <laughs> gonna leave the floor and it's, uh, the Senate is entirely sincere about bringing this forward. So uh, talk to me all you want, uh, happy to be part of any solution, but we can't go home doing nothing. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Senator Abler. Senator Klein. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, Senators Dreheim and Rosen for the bill. And I just wanna call out one provision in particular. Thanks for working closely. With Senator Isaacson on the idea of urgency rooms for minors for psychiatric um, urgent concerns. We know that it's an idea in its infancy. Obviously, you know, we're going to keep working on it and get it right before it's all over. But uh, I appreciate, similar to what you did with the moratorium, that you're sort of throwing a rock in the pond. We all know there's this terrible situation where young people go into emergency rooms and sometimes sit there for days because there's no mental health beds. It's the worst possible way to care for a young person in crisis. It's traumatic to the family. And, you know, frankly, we can do better. So thanks for looking at a uh, novel solution and hopefully it becomes something that actually helps. So. Thank you. Any further comments, questions? See none. Uh, Senator Dreheim and Senator Rosen, if you'd like to add final comments to this bill and then we'll renew our motion. Thank you, uh, Chair Aki and, and members for the great discussion today. Um, you know, I, I, I think I've said it all that I, that I wanted to say, um, you know, I, I just hope we can get this across the finish line. Um, please reach out to your house members and, and push them uh, to come up with, with some ideas so we can come together and maybe a conference committee and, and actually get something across the finish line. So uh, thank you. Thank you, Senator Rosen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'd like to thank Mr. Albright for your work on this. Um, like I said, we've, we've been working with a, a lot of stakeholders on this. And I can remember when we're starting, here go back memory lane again, but 20 years ago, sitting on uh, Senator Berglund's committee, we hardly ever talked about mental health as openly as we are now. And it is not a partisan issue. We need to, we need to get some serious money on the ground and we need to start thinking out of the box I think that's what this bill does. It addresses the, all the needs possible. I mean, we can continue to, to do more, but we've started a really great an, um, initiative here going forward and we can continue to build off of it. Thank you. Senator Draham, if you'd like to renew your motion that Senate file 3249 be recommended to pass as amended and then sent on to the Committee on Finance. So moved, Chair. Thank you. Members, we've got the motion before us. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes. You are off to finance. Thank you, Senator Graham, Senator Rosen, and to all of our members who participated. Thank you. With that, we, we are adjourned. Is this for the today. end of the line, Mr. Chair? For what was that? Is this the end? Okay, uh, <laughs> Senator Abler, you are correct. Wow. So what are our amazing staff going to do in the meantime? They've been working their fingers to the bone for us here. Uh, just want to express my appreciation for what they do, so. Yes, yeah, they've, <laughs> they've done a great job in that uh, uh, little breath of fresh air. They, I think they will enjoy it greatly. So thank you. And with that, we will stand adjourned for today. Thank you all. <laughs>